The Sign of the Beaver by Elizabeth George Spear A Dell Yearling Book A Newberry Honor Book Reading Level 5.7 Chapter 3 He was sitting on the flat stone that served as a doorstep waiting for his supper to cook. The late sun slanted in long yellow bars across the clearing. The forest beyond was already in shadow. Matt was feeling well pleased with his day. That morning he had shot a rabbit. He had skinned it carefully, stretching the fur against the cabin wall to dry. Chunks of meat were boiling now in the kettle over the fire, and the good smell came through the door and made his mouth water. In the dimness of the trees, a darker shadow moved. This time it didn't disappear, but came steadily nearer. He could hear the crackle of twigs under heavy boots. Matt leapt to his feet. Pa! No answer. It wasn't his father, of course. It couldn't be. An Indian? Matt felt a curl of alarm against his backbone. He stood waiting, his muscles tensed. The man who came tramping out from the trees was not an Indian. He was heavy set, the fat bulging under a ragged blue army coat. His face was almost invisible behind a tangle of reddish whiskers. Halfway across the clearing, he stopped. Howdy! he called cheerfully. Hello, Matt answered uncertainly. Is this someone who ought to be greeted like a deacon? The stranger came closer so that Matt could see the small blue eyes that glittered in the weather-hardened face. The man stood, deliberately taking his time, looking over the cabin and the cornfield. Nice place you got here. Matt said nothing. The man peered curiously over Matt's shoulder through the empty door. He could easily see that the cabin was empty. You all alone here? Matt hesitated. My father is away just now. Be back soon, Willie? Matt was puzzled by his own unwillingness to answer. He ought to be glad to see anyone after all these days alone, but somehow he wasn't. He didn't quite know why he found himself lying. Any time now, he said. He went back to the river to get supplies. He might be back tonight. When I saw you come in, I thought it was him. Guess I surprised you. Reckon you don't get much company way off here. No, we don't, Matt answered. Then your pappy wouldn't want you to turn away a visitor, would he? The man asked. Thought maybe you'd ask me to stay for supper. I got a whiff of it half a mile off. Matt remembered his manners. The man's easy grin was beginning to wipe away some of his doubts. Of course, he said. Come in, sir. The man snorted. Ben's the name, he said. You may have heard of me in the river town. We didn't stay in the town very long, Matt answered. He hurried now to light a candle. The stranger stood inside the door, taking in every inch of the small room. Your pappy knows how to build a good tight house, he said. You reckon I'm staying here for good? It's our land, Matt told him. In the candlelight, the room looked snug and homey, something to be proud of showing off to a stranger. My mother and sister will be coming soon. More folks coming all the time, the man said. Time was you could tramp for a month and never see a chimney. Now the town is spreading out from the river every which way. His eye fell on the rifle hanging over the door. He let out a long, admiring whistle and walked over to run his hand along the stock. Mighty fine piece, he said, worth a passel of beaver. My father wouldn't sell it, Matt said shortly. He was busy himself now to make the stranger welcome. He scooped out a good measure of flour, stirred in some water, patted the dough out on a clean ash board, and popped it up in front of the fire to bake. He laid out the two bowls on the table and the two pewter spoons. He poured molasses into the one pewter dish, then he ladled the hot stew into the bowls. The way that stew disappeared, that stranger couldn't have eaten a meal for a good while. Matt took a very small share for himself. He pulled back his hand and watched the man snatch the last bit of corn cake, sopping up the last of the molasses with it. Finally, Ben pushed back his stool and drew the back of his hand across his beard. That was mighty tasty, son, mighty tasty. You wouldn't have a mite of tobacco now, would you? Oh, I'm sorry, Matt said. My father doesn't have any. Pity. Can't be helped, I suppose. In the easy silence that followed, Matt decided to ask a question of his own. Are you traveling to the river? Ben snorted again. Not likely. I'm keeping as fur off on that river as I can till things quiet down. Matt waited. 
tell the truth. I got away from that town just in time. Weren't nothing they could prove, but they sure had it in for me. So I says, Ben, I says, you been planning on getting yourself some beaver pelts? Looks like now's the time to get moving. I aim to settle in with the Redskins a bit, maybe move on to north. You mean you're going to live with the Indians? Could do worse. I, I can bed down about anywheres. It certainly looked as though invited or not, Ben was planning on bedding down right here in the cabin. He had eased himself off the stool and sprawled out on the floor, his shoulders propped against the wall. He pulled a dirty corncob pipe from his pocket and stared down at it ruefully. Pity, he said again. Feels like that need baffy to settle it right. He put the pipe away and shifted his heavy bulk against the wall. When I was not more than your age, he drawled, well fed and ready to talk, I'd spend the whole winter with the Redskins. Hunt with them, trap, easy to pick up their lingo. Still remember a good deal of it. But this country ain't the same any more. You gotta go west, Ohio maybe, to get any decent trapping. The Indians still hunt here, don't they? Matt asked. The Indians is mostly cleared out of these parts, Ben told him. What wasn't killed off in the war got took with the sickness. A deal of them moved on to Canada. What's left makes a mighty poor living game getting so scarce. Where do they live? Frown bow. Ben waved vaguely toward the forest. They make small camps for a while and then move on. The Penobscot, stick-like burrs, won't give up. They still hunt and trap. No way to stop them. Never got it through their heads they don't still own this land. You never seen none of them? My father did once. Do they speak English? Enough to get what they want. They pick it up from the traders. What pelts they can scrape together, they take into the towns. They can strike a sharp deal. You gotta know how to handle them. Reason you ain't seen them, he went on. They got enough sense to clear out of these parts when the bugs is bad. They move off the whole lot down to the coast to get their year's mess of clams. Should be moving back about now. They'll stay the summer and then go off for the big hunt come fall. Them hunts, he remembered, ain't nothing like them nowadays. Bows and arrows was all they had. Still use them some if they can't lay hands on a gun. I got so's I was dem near as good as any of them. Don't suppose I could hit a barn door now. Ben's voice drawled on and on, thick with food and drowsiness. He told of the big moose hunts of his days with the Indians. He had fought in the recent war against the French, and he despised them for stirring up the Indians against the main settlements. He seemed to have single-handedly shot down half the French army. Especially he hated the Jesuit priests who had egged the Redskins on, and he had once been part of an expedition that broke into a chapel and smashed the Popish idols. Once he had been taken captive by the fierce Iroquois who were set on putting him to torture. He had been too smart for them and escaped in the night. Listening, Matt couldn't make the man out. To hear him talk, he'd been as big a hero as Jack the Giant Killer, but he didn't look the part. He had certainly fallen, fallen on hard times of late. No doubt about it, however, he could tell a good story. The man's voice was trailing off, and he slumped lower and lower. Presently, he was sprawled flat on the floor and snoring. It was clear enough that he could bed down anywhere. At least he hadn't taken over Matt's bed. Matt moved about quietly, though he doubted anything could disturb his guest. He cleaned off the bowls with his twig brush, then he banked the fire with ashes. Finally, he settled down on his hemlock mattress. But he couldn't sleep. He lay staring up at the log roof, even after the last flickers of firelight had died away and the cabin was in darkness. He couldn't quiet his uneasy thoughts. Bragging about his adventures by the fire, Ben had seemed harmless, just a fat, tired old man grateful for a good meal. To be honest, Matt had enjoyed his company. Now he began to worry. How long was Ben going to stay? He was sure to find out soon that Matt was living alone. When he did, would he decide it was more comfortable here than in an Indian village? At the rate he had wolfed down that supper, the flour and molasses wouldn't hold out long. Would he expect Matt to go on providing meals and waiting on him? Then why had he left that town on the river in such a hurry? Was there really some charge against him? Was he dangerous, perhaps even a murderer? At the thought, Matt sat up on his pine bed. He'd be sensible to stay awake and on guard. He'd half a mind to fetch down his father's rifle and keep it near at hand. Then he felt ashamed. What would his father say about begrudging a stranger a meal and a night's rest? All the same, he was determined not to shut his eyes that night. He kept them open for a long time, but suddenly he jerked out of a deep sleep and saw that daylight was streaming across the cabin floor. The cabin door was open, and the man was gone. Perhaps he had only stepped outside. 
Matt stumbled to the door. No sign of the stranger. Relief flooded over him. All that worrying the man had never intended to stay. Perhaps he'd actually believed the lie that his father was returning that day. Then once again Matt felt ashamed. He must have made it only too plain that Ben wasn't welcome. Would Pa say he had done wrong? Still, it was too early to be sure. At any moment Ben might appear hungry for breakfast. He'd better stir up some fresh corn cake. It was then that he noticed. His father's rifle was not hanging over the door. In a panic, he searched the cabin, his own bed, the corner shelves, under the table, and the stools. He rushed back to the door and onto the edge of the forest. It was no use, no way of telling which way the man had taken or how long he had been on his way while Matt slept. Ben was gone, and so was the rifle. He should have kept it in his hands, as his hunch had warned him. He could see down that the man had had his mind set on that gun from the moment he laid eyes on it. But even if Matt had had it in his hands, could he have held out against those burly arms? And to keep his gun, could he actually have shot a man, even a criminal? It was only later, when his rage began to die down, that he felt a prickle of fear. Now he had no protection and no way to get meat. Sick with anger, he sat staring at his row of notch sticks. It would be a month at least before his father returned, a month of nothing but fish. And what would his father say? Chapter 4 It was hard to be deprived of the hunting. Now, whenever he went into the forest, the squirrels and the rabbits frisked about boldly, knowing perfectly well he had no gun in his hands. Once he was certain he could have had a good shot at a deer. Instead, he went fishing, and he knew he ought to be grateful that the creek and the pond could provide all the food he needed, even though fish didn't seem to stick to his ribs like a good meat stew. Here and there in a sunny spot, he discovered a patch of blueberries. Gradually, his spirits rose again. The July weather was perfect. The flies and mosquitoes were less bothersome. He began to count the days ahead instead of the ones he had notched. Two or three more sticks and his family would be here. The corn was growing taller. The little hard green pumpkins were rounding out. He could wait a little longer. Perhaps he even became a mite careless. He'd been fishing all one morning, a good clear day, the water still nippy on his ankles, the sun warm on his bare head. He had followed the creek a long way and had a lucky catch. He came whistling out of the woods, swinging four speckled trout. He quieted down all of a sudden when he heard a crackling in the underbrush close by. Then he stopped short at the side of the cabin. The door was swinging open at a crazy angle, one hinge broken. Across the door still, some white stuff dribbled like spilled flour. With a shout, he dropped the fish and ran. It was flour, tracked all over the cabin floor. The sack ripped open and dragged across the room. The cabin was a shambles, the stools overturned, the shelf swept bare, the precious molasses keg upside down on the floor and empty. Ben must have come back. For a moment, hot sparks of anger drove every sensible thought out of his head. Then he knew it couldn't have been Ben. Ben was too fond of food to waste it. Indians? No, it wasn't possible any human being would scatter food about like this. With a sinking heart, he realized what had happened. He remembered the thrashing in the underbrush. It had to be a bear. Somehow, he had neglected to bar the door securely. Well, the damage was done and the bear would be half a mile away by now. Helpless with fury at his own carelessness, he stood for some time in the middle of the cabin, unable to pull his wits together. Then he went down on his hands and knees and carefully began to scrape up the traces of flour. After a time, he gave up. The best he had managed to salvage was two handfuls of gritty, unappetizing meal, even though he took the good pewter spoon and dug into the hollows of the dirt floor. After a long time, he felt hungry enough to remember the fish. Half-heartedly he cleaned them and blew up the fire and roasted them. He found a few grains of salt left in the tin to sprinkle on them. He would have to make the best of it. He wouldn't starve as long as he had a fish line. But tomorrow he would not even have salt. 